Managing Fortiche is like, sometimes I feel like a, a band manager. Like, guys, you're doing whatever you want, but I want you on stage at this time for the concert and the gig. And they're always on time at the end. So you have to trust them. Zero. <laughs> so we are in 2017, and everybody is working really hard to deliver the pilot. And then uh, we had a discussion with Riot, explaining to us that we're not happy with the script, with episode two, and episode three. At the end of the call, we were like, ah, have they have really said that? I think we have misunderstood them. When we arrived in LA, and then it was, hey guy, yes, we want to do a pause on the production, put it everything on hold. We were like, oh my gosh, that was true. Everything is going to shit right now. I guess that was pretty much at the point where they had drafted together a couple of scripts and sort of a show bible for the entire season. The next thing I know, uh, Christian mysteriously gets pulled into a meeting and then it was like a strange intervention where a bunch of other rioters basically told him that it sucked. <laughs> it was such a blow to the team to just feel like, man, we're being told to stop completely and potentially even find different, different showrunners, different writers for the whole thing. You know, you've been you've been killing yourself, you know, to try and try and make it work and try and figure it out. And you, like just I mean, your first thought, of course, is just like, is it dead? We were really only able to hire all these animators with the promise that there would be a full season to work on because, you know, they're very, very talented and you really only get them if you have something kind of worth committing to, you know, like a, a multi year project. And so we just kind of had this feeling like we're gonna have to tell all these people that we just hired. They have to be like, oh, um, which just, I don't know, it's just like the worst thought. I think Alex and I just felt like we suck. <laughs> like we just, we, we failed, you know. Christian's a tortured artist who can't let himself not do something great. Like it just, he will will it into existence because he just, he will beat himself up and lose sleep and go crazy. There were a lot of times during my career at Ride so far where I needed someone like Brandon or Mark to explore some pretty wild ideas. You know, where a lot of people would say, like, no one in the video game industry has full-time composers, you know? Like, we can just hire someone from the outside as a freelancer to make some music for us. Or why would we make music videos? That's insane, you know? Like, video game companies don't make music videos. Back then, it was Mark and Brandon who kind of saw the idea and, like, how awesome this could be and they took bets on, you know, me being able to figure it out. So then in the meeting, everyone left, it was just Brandon and me, and basically, I think Brandon kind of took like the moment to kind of tell me, hey, like, we'll figure it out. You know, like, we trust you, you know, like, we'll figure it out. Um, and I just started crying. Christian's biggest fear is letting players down. He crushes himself over it. It's actually painful for those closest to him to sort of watch, and it gives you so much respect and appreciation and ultimately trust in, in what you know, he decides to take responsibility and ownership for. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about our decision to delay the further production of the follow-up episodes of Arcane. I remember I think I recorded like 16 different versions of this video because I just always was just kind of sitting there like, um, bleh. And I wanted to give you guys some more information about it, you know, why, what our plan is, and so on. And I'm sure you've heard them from... We did not show this. <laughs> the question was, if we start with that, everybody will cry, everybody will jump out of the window. I finally made a version of the video that I felt like was okay, and I sent it to them, only to learn a few weeks later that they were like, yeah, we never showed it to anyone because you just looked so depressed. You look like you want to kill yourself. Like, how could we ever show that to anyone? So it was like a harsh time, harsh time. So we had to uh, let the team go, which is always uh, very painful. 
uh, you're not sure they're going to be able to come back because if they go to another production, you might lose them. We knew that we wouldn't have work for them for the months to come. So we started talking to different teams at Wright and started asking people, hey, is there anything we can do, like a music video or anything that could just keep, you know, the lights on at Fortiche? We talked to the esports team and there was a desire to make a music video. Which became the Rise music video. And then we started talking to the music team and they were working on something like a crazy idea uh, about a K-pop group. So they did two music videos with us, which I think are still some of the best, if not the two best on our, on our YouTube channel. Thank God uh, Alex and I are shit at our jobs because if we hadn't taken that extra time to develop the story, the KDA Pop Stars music video and the Rise music video would have never happened. Ces deux, ces deux clips nous ont permis aussi de, de résoudre certains petits problèmes techniques qu'on pouvait avoir sur qu'on qu avait pu avoir sur le, le, le pilote et d'affirmer de, de, un peu plus le style de la série. So, you're welcome. from the Undercity. I was an outsider the moment I stepped foot in Piltover. I didn't have the benefits of a patron or a name. I simply believed in myself. At that point, the idea was I had to replace myself as like the person in charge of figuring out the story. Of course, you know, it was me and Alex, but I was responsible. We just knew we had to hire someone who's experienced as a showrunner and as writers and that kind of stuff. And that's what we tried to do. Except we couldn't really find anyone. Six years ago, if you pitched that the video company was gonna do like an animated series that is looking for like drama screenwriters, no one really showed up. Or it was just, you know, people were and for the wrong reasons, you know, where it was like, well, I mean, League of Legends and Riot is big, but they didn't really care about the characters that much. So we were looked for quite a while, and at some point, we just felt like maybe we'll just kind of have to try again, but be less shitty. <laughs> and then, yeah, I mean, it was just start over, you know, like kind of like, look, Look at what we do. This when we started talking to showrunners, you know, like like who who could we bring in to just be an advisor? That's when we found Monica Maser. You know, she was a showrunner. She worked on Lost. Was someone who was really passionate about mentoring people, and she really helped us find the right way to realize our vision. You know, without necessarily being like, here's what you have to do. More just about here's all about the process of how to craft a season, how to think about developing characters. And then we hired, you know, a bunch of writers who'd worked in various capacities in TV. So, you know, Amanda uh, was one of those writers. Oh, I know. I know. It's so good. It's so good. You're like always trying to get into the heads of your characters in any way you can. I did have one of the writers teach me how to shoot a gun, like a sniper gun, right before I was gonna write Caitlin's episode last year. We're in my house, and I have a little office here where I do my writing. Nice. Can you show me that? Sure. <laughs> Through the kitchen, <laughs> into my nook. I have these lights I turn on at night to sort of Inspire me. There we go. <laughs> they'll have scripts that they'll send over to you as kind of a sample of their work. And Amanda, I think with hers, it was comic book video game scientist. And her story was about a future world where we've colonized the moon. Uh, and I was like, this seems like it could be a good fit for us. I would prefer not to have a punching bag in my living room, but that's just what we do right now. So <laughs> I actually never thought about how my Kung Fu translates to learning how vice a fighter. 
Rotten luck, boys. But there's a fight scene in episode five of season one, which uh, is the episode I wrote. One of the things I'm like so proud of is it's like between two women with like a different body type, different, like both like really muscular. They're doing moves that you haven't necessarily seen women do before on screen. <laughs> I always think of fight scenes as like being just like another talking drama scene. Like there has to be a turn, there has to be motivations. You have to learn something new about the character in the fight that you didn't know before. I'll give her your regards. And then of course she's saved by another woman. Three women in a fight scene, it's fucking dope, so. Amanda just has a really honest voice in her dialogue that is just really grounded emotionally. I remember this moment when Alex and I were really wrestling with the last words that Jinx was saying to Vi in season one. And then like Amanda took the script and solved it in like, I don't know, an hour. I thought maybe you could love me like you used to. Even though I'm different. But you change too. So, here's to the new us. Amanda just wrote that and Alex and I were just like, yep, that, 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 and we just, we just couldn't do that, you know? I think the biggest change from the way that we were looking at it before was it was very plot heavy, right? It's very focused on kind of like, what's the problem that has to get solved? Who's gonna fight who? What I think most improved after kind of working with these writers was sort of like the emotional story for the characters. I'm quite proud of the cold open too, the like whole beginning of the season with the bridge. The cold open used to be the cold open from episode three when Silco was drowning. I sort of went out on a limb being like, so guys, I know you hired me to help out with the show and whatever, but you need to change the pilot. That's a lovely poetic image, right? But it wasn't telling the story of the series, which is these two sisters being torn apart. That's when I came in as a CEO, taking this big role with the idea of becoming a multi-game developer and a multi-game publisher, which on its own is a really difficult challenge to go from that one hit to multiple games. And then there, there was this little curveball, and oh, and by the way, we have this TV show, which probably is gonna cost us, you know, a massive nine-digit budget. There is a lot of risk in this. To be completely honest, Niccolo and I were always on like completely opposite spectrums. He's a business person, he's someone who's just extremely smart in like a rational way. He does he doesn't really let it himself get carried away by like his emotions or like by his own personal attachment to anything. And I'm the opposite. I'm always, I'm, I always have opinions. I'm always, you know, emotionally attached to the stuff that I work on. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an artiste, I guess. Christian, actually, I remember I bring him in my, in my office to say, hey, we've, we've decided if we're, gonna, if we're gonna fund you for a full season. He had done the pilot and, you know, we paused. And I told him like, we're, we're not gonna fund uh, a full season for, for Arcane. And then I told him like, I think it's really important you understand why, because you and I can be on a different page, but it's very important you understand where I'm coming from. And the reason I'm not gonna validate you to move to a full season is because I'm gonna allow you to move to multiple seasons. <laughs> and so uh, I kind of trolled him a bit. He pulled a bit of a prank. And I think he was really pissed at me for this. <laughs> so yeah, he definitely gave me the trust that I needed to build develop Arcane the way that Fortiche and our team at Riot needed to do it, you know, which was not the easy way, but like really this like pursuit of like, hey, this is what we think our audience wants and it's ambitious and crazy, but we need you to trust us. And he did. You need to stay committed to players because nothing's gonna be easy. There will be many moments where you wanna give up. I know Christian went through this multiple times, we went through this multiple times, and you need to have the, the grit and the courage to, to continue for players. As we were looking at trying to scale a lot more and then 
we had season one in production and we started to think about how are we gonna do the first development of season two at the same time. That's when we started looking for someone to help figuring out the production scale a bit more. It was tough because we couldn't find the right culture fit. A lot of people kind of shied away from like, hey, this isn't normal TV, this isn't normal animation. Um, I think I'm just gonna go, you know, insert any animation studio out there, right? And, but finally, one time I got connected with a woman named Melinda Dilger. Hey guys, come on in. Welcome to Casa de Dilger. <laughs> I work here because of COVID. This is Willie Nelson. He's the boss of Arcane right here. He's in all the meetings. He loves it. He loves his job. Yes. I just love talking to her. She had such a warm energy. She just also had experience. Like I mentioned some of the issues that we were dealing with and she seemed unfazed by it. This is where all my meetings happen. It's very exciting. This is where I burn off my energy. And I got that when I worked on Mary Poppins Returns, which is kind of cool. Yeah. I remember sitting down all of the stakeholders and I think I literally told them, you better not fuck this up. I like her, she's awesome. If you fuck this up, I'm gonna kill you. I was producing by the time I was 24. That was when I was really young. I worked on Darkwing Duck. That was my very first animated show to be on as a production assistant. I was working on Goof Troop, Aladdin. I won an Annie Award. That's kind of a big deal right here. This is very proud, very proud of this. Very nice. I know whenever people tell me, they're like, oh my gosh, I watched that as a child. I'm like, oh. I'm so old, but it's okay, no, no, no. it's okay. <laughs> you know, now everybody looks at me and they say, we're so glad we have somebody with so much experience on the show, which really equates to old, but it's okay. I can take it, you know. <laughs> Riot's a very young company. Hey, and I am rolling. <laughs> All right, I think you've had enough, mate. Yeah, the team health when I first started wasn't so great. Everyone was like, I was like, man, this team, they need some loving. They need some loving. Making the show that we kind of set out with Arcane, you know, with the right designs for these characters that work in our IP, you know, this fantasy world. The pursuit of creative work is complex. If your expectation is that you're gonna work on something creatively where you're gonna have no pressure or, or no feeling of like being overwhelmed at times, then you're working on something the world is gonna forget. By then, I think I was super exhausted because I was like three years into the project or something. Uh, I know Christian was exhausted, Alex was beat, and like she brought in that new energy and just sort of this like, yep, let's pick it up and let's go. How are you guys feeling? Yeah, are you exhausted. You want a break? Yeah. Cool. Are you okay to keep going? Yeah. From what I was hearing, it was just taking them a long time to kind of get their bearings. And let's face it, Fortiche, our animation partner studio in Paris, they had also never produced a series. So you have a bunch of newbies trying to figure this out and lo and behold, it is really a difficult process and it's a challenging one, even for those of us that have been in a, the business for a really long time. You missed a really long, important strategy meeting that answers all the questions of the universe. That, that, was, that was a Rosebud meeting. For Riot and Beyond. The Rosebud meeting. Melinda was always someone that is extremely inspiring to the team and creating a team atmosphere where it's okay when things are tough as long as you just kind of believe in the team and have the right dream together. It's like, you know, uh, well, you know, you can get everything in here. Like, uh, oh, gee. Oh, God, oh. <laughs> See, you guys didn't think you'd be on behind the scenes and here you are. There's Eric Bergman, our post supervisor. Hi, Eric's used to all the publicity. Eric, you're on mute. See, this is what we do every Zoom call. Hello. hello Somebody's hello, always hello. on mute. Hi, hi, yes. Everyone. Nice to meet you. <laughs> hey there. I just came in and kind of rolled up my sleeves and went from department by department, just trying to get everybody together and get to know each individual on the team as a person. This is a French studio and there's no wine, but you have it's, IPA. It's, full. it's like there's two teams, the, the beer team and the wine team. Well, where's the wine team? <laughs> And that's part of building team trust. And then you can start to actually solve the problems. Dig deep. That's what you gotta do. So this is our production schedule in March of 2020. That's when this started. 
and then it goes all the way through the last episode. Because this is the first series Riot's ever done, a lot of things are getting figured out and developed as we go along in production. So it's taking a little bit longer than it typically would on a television series that's all thought out. Everything's figured out way ahead of time. This is like, how can we make this more unique and more special than any other show on television? Let's take our time and do it right. And if it takes us a little bit longer to get those scripts done, that's what we do. There's a natural balance of power and you just gave everybody nukes. Congratulations, you fucked up, right? This is the thing that's always been a little fuzzy to me is just kind of how we end this episode with the Victor Singe thing. Yes, I would love to bring Vi back into Caitlin's mind in this episode yeah. in some way. I wrote like something about missing Vi uh, that I have not solved yet either. Um, yeah. And to kind of like take the IP that's there from the games and turn it into something really awesome for television is a challenge. They're gonna spend more money than most people to get it there, but they're doing it because they love the players and they want the players to be happy. And it's special. It's like you don't just see them as these little tiny things walking across the screen. By putting them on television, they have soul and they're deep and you can relate to them. One of the biggest questions we had though was, can this be sustained over six hours? Will people watch something like this and fall into the immersion of, of the animation? Do you actually have that quality to mesmerize an audience by staring at two characters, not saying a word? It's all between them and the air and the emotions. We all want to take animation to this place of mature drama. Subtlety and nuance. Style and, and innovation. But it doesn't exist. And I think we together can do it.